Welcome to another interview in the series of interviews conducted by the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. In this interview segment, we are seeking the life trajectories of eminent scientists and prominent aspects in their journeys that assist them to reach where they are today. I'm Kesari Varnakula Surya, a fourth year undergraduate in the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. Today, here with us is a prominent scientist who has excelled in the field of chemistry. She is none other than Professor Hema Karuna Dasa. To elaborate more on her, I'll hand over the discussion to Tanujit. It's over to you. Thank you, Kesari. I am Tanujit Zayavarguna, and I too am a fourth year undergraduate at the Department of Chemistry, University of Colombo. Today, we have with us Professor Hema Karuna Dasa. Born and educated in Colombo, Professor Karuna Dasa is a renowned chemist who currently works as an assistant professor at Stanford University. She completed her undergraduate studies on chemistry and material science at Princeton University and then joined the University of California, Berkeley for her doctoral studies. Furthermore, she was a postdoc at UC Berkeley with Professors Christopher Chang and Jeffrey Long and with Professor Harry Gray at Caltech. She joined the Department of Chemistry at Stanford in 2012, where she works on hybrid, organic, inorganic materials such as peroxide. Earlier this year, she was awarded the Harry Gray Award for Creative Work in Inorganic Chemistry by a young investigator for obtaining structural control over the photophysics of new halide peroxide. Congratulations, Professor, on this wonderful achievement, and it is an honor and a privilege to be conducting this interview with you. So, Professor, before we move into a more detailed discussion about science, can you tell us a little bit about the early days of your life? Sure, uh, early days of my life. Um, well, I, I grew up in Sri Lanka, in Colombo. And uh, like all through school, I went to Ladies College, Colombo 7. Uh, that was wonderful. I had a wonderful time uh, in school. And uh, I took the standard, you know, standard... Uh, I studied in Singhala and I took the local A O levels and local A levels. And I thought I was going to be a doctor. So I took the standard, um, what are those subjects? Uh, oh my gosh, that was a long time ago. Uh, chemistry, physics, zoology, and botany. Uh, oh my gosh, I studied botany. <laughs> and um, uh, so I don't know if it's still true, but when I was a student, at the, after you take your A levels, there's a, a year when you have nothing to do uh, because the exam is being graded and that takes a year. So uh, during that year, I did, you know, random things. I think I was even a substitute teacher in my school, ladies college, but I was still bored. And I had a friend who was applying to the US for college. So I figured I had nothing better to do. So I decided to join her. So just for fun, I applied uh, to a few universities in the US, never expecting to, to leave the country. Um, and I remember it was just, it was just for fun. I, I didn't, I decided then that I would not spend any money on this. <laughs> so I only applied to schools that gave fee waivers to, to international students. Uh, so I sent those applications in, I never expected to hear back, but uh, I was really surprised to get admission. Uh, so I got admission at uh, Princeton and Smith. And then I was really torn because I had to decide whether to go to med school in, in, in Colombo or to go to, to Princeton and study something that I hadn't yet decided on. So it was whether, whether to take the, the safe path or the unknown path. But uh, the offer from Princeton was, was really generous. So they covered all financial aid. So it was practically a free ride. Um, so I decided to take the plunge. <laughs> so I, I then, then moved to, then I came to the U.S. when I was around 18, uh, went to Princeton for college, uh, and there I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do because I had given up med school. And then I met this professor, uh, Professor Robert Carver, who introduced me to materials chemistry. And that was really the start of my career. So I did uh, research in his lab as an undergrad. And uh, yeah, that was the beginning. <laughs> is that early enough? Um, yeah, Professor, well, uh, my next question is also connected to the previous one. Uh, yes. What inspired you to become a scientist? Was it a lifelong ambition or something that happened spontaneously? 
Um, you know, I always liked science. I can't remember ever not liking science. I, know, I didn't think I would be a scientist when I was very young because uh, again, in Sri Lanka, there's this, um, you know, there's this hierarchy where like you take your A-levels and then if you score at the top, they say, well, then you must want to be a doctor. And then you go down this hierarchy and at the very bottom you get like scientist. <laughs> so that I think uh, influenced many of us to thinking, oh, we probably want to be a doctor because that's at the top. But when I finally went, you know, I, I did all that and I finished my A-levels, I realized I really wasn't that interested in medicine, but I was really interested in, in, in science. I didn't know it was chemistry at the time. But so I guess I didn't know I would be a scientist, but I always liked science. Those were always my favorite subjects in school. Yeah. Okay, so Professor, as I've heard, most of your work is in relation to materials chemistry. So as a materials chemist, why do you think that it is an interesting scientific discipline and uh, what made you so passionate about it? Um, so I think the, the best argument I have made I have heard about why materials chemistry is important is that, you know, materials define just our human civilizations, right? Uh, you know, we went from the Stone Age to the, to the Iron Age, and it's the discovery of a material that was the next step in our, in, in, in our civilization. And it's exciting to think about, you know, what material will define the next step in the future. So now our needs are so much more complex that it's not going to be one material. And uh, also because of the complexity of our needs, it's not going to be a material that you dig out from the ground. We'll have to make this material. So uh, what could be more exciting than uh, making the materials that will be the basis for the next step in, uh, in our civilization, probably in terms of saving ourselves and the planet. <laughs> and in terms of why I like it, I think for me, the most exciting aspect of my day is seeing a new material. So we synthesize materials and then we crystallize it, we characterize it, and we are the first people on the planet to see the material we synthesize. And that, I always get a kick out of that, to, to know that I saw this first, or even to think, you know, I saw this in my dreams before I even made it. So I love being the first person to see the structure of a new material. That's, I, I think, I, I remember as an undergrad, that was what really got me into this field to begin with, when I, I was synthesizing perovskites, even as an undergraduate. And uh, we saw this crystal structure, and, you know, my advisor and I were sitting in front of, the, in front of the computer, and he told me, you know, you are the first person to see the structure. This is a new material. And I thought that was incredible. So it's, it's that feeling that I want all the time, which is why I'm in materials chemistry. Um, as I have realized, your research group works on exploring and designing hybrid perovskites for photovoltaic applications. Could you explain us a little bit about what perovskites are and how they could be utilized as efficient absorbers for solar cells? Yeah, um, so these, uh, these are not new materials. So halide perovskites uh, were discovered in the 18th century. And researchers have been studying these materials since the early 1900s. What the, the exciting discovery that occurred more recently was the knowledge of what happens to this material if it's used as an absorber in a solar cell. So it's the semiconducting properties of these old materials that have created such a storm in the photovoltaic community. So uh, let me, if I remember correctly, it was in 2009 that this Japanese group decided to take this halide perovskite, this lead iodide halide perovskite and use it as an absorber in a solar cell. So the job of an absorber is to absorb sunlight and generate electrons and holes. These electrons and holes have to not find each other again and recombine. They have to live for long enough and move fast enough that they can reach the current collectors. So the electrons go in one direction, the holes go in another direction and you form current. So it turned out this material performed surprisingly well. And the reason there's so much excitement in this field is how quickly the efficiencies of solar cells using these materials as absorbers has increased. Uh, so it, the increase has been faster than any other absorber. 
So then the question is, why does everyone care about this over like standard materials like silicon, gallium, arsenide? And what really distinguishes the halide perovskites is that you make them in solution. So you can even make them in water. So that means the manufacture is extremely cheap. And it also turns out that even if someone who doesn't really have expertise in the device manufacture, even if they make it, the device is pretty good. Whereas for other materials, you really have to have, you know, high tech equipment and, and expertise in the field to, to really make pristine silicon to get a high efficiency. Uh, you know, there are high school students who make perovskite solar cells and they actually have pretty good efficiencies. <laughs> So it turns out that even if you make it in a dirty lab, even if the material isn't perfect, it still does a really good job absorbing sunlight and uh, generating current. Yeah, so there's, you know, it has incredible semiconductor properties. It has two main problems. Uh, and the main problems are that it's, uh, it's a toxic source of water soluble lead. Uh, and the second problem is that it, uh, it has issues with stability. So those are the no main problems that we are trying to address in our research. So Professor, uh, you've been able to build a lab centered on developing materials for clean energy using perovskites. So how do you feel about this and about being able to carry out research experiments with students at Stanford? Um, I mean, it's nice to do something that's even tangentially relevant. <laughs> so uh, I, I did want my, in my independent career to work on materials relevant to clean energy. So it feels, it feels like we're putting uh, our skills to good use in, ac in at least doing the fundamental studies that will then be taken over by engineers who will take it the next step towards uh, devices and technology. So it feels great uh, to, to work in clean energy. And uh, it's, uh, it's a real privilege to work uh, with students at Stanford. So I, I get to recruit the very best students from around the world. And uh, with, with this team, you know, we, they come up with the ideas, they do the research, sometimes they'll explain it to me. So it's, uh, it's a good life. <laughs> Uh, well, Professor, would you like to share with us some of the intriguing research concepts that you are currently focusing on and how would it render the benefits to the environment as well as to the mankind? Uh, sure. So we have several different projects. Um, since you asked me about perovskite solar cells, and I told you the main problem is, one of the main problems is that the best performing solar cells are made with lead. And it's not just lead, it's a water soluble source of lead. So it's like table salt, right? So it's like lead chloride is like table salt and this material is practically lead chloride. So the question is, are we really going to coat our roofs with an ionic form of lead that will very easily dissolve in water, contaminate the waterways? And if there's any, any, any problem, any contamination, the, it'll be very hard to contain that. So uh, one of the main research directions in my group is to try and figure out what other composition will act like the lead perovskites. Uh, so there are lots of perovskites that don't have lead, but the problem is they don't act like the lead perovskites. So we want a functional analog. Um, so we are focusing on a family of materials called double perovskites, where you basically double the formula, you double the unit cell, so now instead of one octahedral site in the perovskite structure, you have two. So, and basically the, the bottom line is that we don't think there is any one metal that can act like lead, but we think there are two metals that in combination can act like lead. So we are trying to find the metal combinations that have the same properties that we want. So we want materials that can absorb sunlight very well, we separate electrons and holes. We want those electrons and holes to live for a long time without finding each other. And we want the electrons and holes to be able to move very quickly through the material so that they can find the current collectors. So we are developing halide double perovskites as solar cell absorbers. Uh, and we are particularly interested in non-toxic compositions. So we want materials that are less toxic than lead. We want materials that are more stable, more stable to heat, more stable to humidity, more stable to light. Um, so basically functional analogs of the lead perovskites. So. 
Thank you, Professor. So, yeah. apart from being a scientist, you also serve as an editorial advisory board member in the journal Chemistry of Materials. So, can you tell us a little bit about the role that you play here? Yeah. Um, so, I guess in the past, when I've been a advisory board member, I have been called in to um, kind of deal with disputes. So, between uh, authors and reviewers. So let's say someone publishes, submits a manuscript, an author submits a manuscript, it goes out for review. And the reviewers read the manuscript and will give their assessment of whether to publish it or not. And then the authors see that, but then the authors get to give a rebuttal. So the authors could say, no, the reviewers doesn't know what they're talking about. Um, here's our response. We are right, we, don't, we disagree with the reviewers. And then there might at some point be a stalemate where the reviewers say, no, the authors are wrong. And the authors will say, no, the reviewers don't know what they're talking about. And that's usually when they bring a third party. So I have been called in in cases like that, where I read the manuscript, I read the reviews, I read the review response. I, I, I get access to everything. And I kind of have to make a judgment on whether the authors uh, claims uh, are valid or whether the reviewers claims are valid. So I usually take those only when it's really in my field. So, so within halide perovskites. So that's, that's an interesting exercise. And I think that's, it, it's good that authors get a chance to give a rebuttal to reviews so that it, it's a nice process where everyone gets a chance to, to give their point of view. Or I could just, you know, give my own review of the paper saying, I don't agree with anyone <laughs> and that this is, this is what I think about the paper. So it's, it's an interesting exercise. Uh, Professor, during your PhD at the UC Berkeley, you and your research team discovered an inexpensive metal catalyst that has the ability to generate hydrogen by splitting water. So this revelation could be a promising solution to the energy crisis in the near future. How did you, you and your colleagues come up with this discovery? It was a complete accident. <laughs> so in my PhD, I was not looking at catalysts at all. I was trying to synthesize this molecule uh, with, that contained unpaired electrons so to use as a building block for a, a molecular magnet. So I, just, I was trying to make this molybdenum complex um, with uh, three unpaired electrons. And I, I made it, and uh, it was air sensitive material. So I was, uh, I, are you familiar with Schlenk techniques? Uh, so so there's, there are these glass where, where you can do synthesis completely air free. So I was doing the whole synthesis completely air free and water free. And you know, I was synthesizing this molecule all day. And then at the end of the day, late at night, uh, I just, I was done with my day's work and I was just washing up my glassware. And uh, I opened my Schlenk flask to air and I just, you know, poured some water into it just to wash it. And there's a little bit of that molybdenum complex at the bottom of the flask and it started to bubble. And I thought that's strange, why is it bubbling? And it wasn't, you know, the crazy, this is decomposing bubble. It was, uh, it bubbled and made another beautiful green material. So I was very curious, like what happened here? So I, I characterized the, the material that was formed. And it was clear to me that it, there was a molybdenum oxygen bond. So that was uh, kind of interesting. So I was wondering where did that oxygen come from? Was it water or was it air? So there are ways to label water. So, so instead of uh, the O16, you can use O18 water. And if you do this reaction with the O18 water, you realize that the molybdenum now has the O18 oxygen. So from that reaction, we, we realized that this molecule could split a molecule of water and, and, ma and make a molybdenum oxygen bond. So we assumed that means it's spitting out hydrogen. So that was just, you know, that is a cool reaction, but that was just one reaction. Uh, but when I told my advisor about this, he said, well, if you could make this catalytic, we are really in business. So then we decided to look at this molecule under electrocatalytic conditions where we continuously add electrons to the metal. So we are continuously regenerating 
the active complex. And when you do that, uh, if you do this in water, it continuously splits water to form hydrogen. So that was the birth of my water splitting catalyst. <laughs> In a recent interview conducted with Professor Harry Gray by uh, a <laughs> colleague, he said that you would be a role model for young scientists. You were able to collaborate with him in your postdoc at Caltech. So how did this experience of working with such an iconic chemist mold your career path? I've always been a big fan of Harry. I think I heard him talk when I was a student and it was just the most amazing chemistry talk I had heard. He was, I mean, I had already, I knew how famous he was and how much work he had done in the field, but that talk was just captivating. <laughs> so ever since I heard him talk at some conference, I, I always wanted to do a postdoc with him. But my grad career was actually pretty slow. Like I had no results for the first four years of my PhD. So I didn't think that uh, I had any chance doing a postdoc with him. But then at the very end, things, a lot of things just worked in year five and year six. As soon as I got some, got some interesting results, I decided now's the chance to apply it to Harry Gray's group. <laughs> uh, it was awesome working with him. I think what I enjoyed most was, uh, you know, Harry comes to, the, to work very early in the morning. And that's the best time to find him because, you know, everyone wants to talk to him. So the, the only time he's actually free is very early in the morning. So I never get up early in the morning, but this was the only time in my life that I woke up as early as I could just to get to be the first person in his office. And uh, what I really admire about him is, you know, he know, you could just come up to Harry and say, Harry, I've been thinking about X. It doesn't matter what X is. He would say, oh, him, I worked on X in 1960, whatever. <laughs> like he, could, he could talk with complete authority on anything. And if you look at his career also, you know, he has done pretty much everything. Like he's not a person who got famous doing one thing and then just kept doing that same thing, right? He, he is fearless, he works on everything. So I think uh, he, he really shows that, you know, inorganic chemists, if you know the fundamentals of inorganic chemistry, you can do pretty much anything. So just talking to him, like any, any conversation, you learn something from him. Uh, professor, in 2014, you were honored as the rising star at the International Conference of Coordination Chemistry in Singapore. Can you recall back to that moment what do you feel about such a great accomplishment? Can I recall that moment? I recall the dinner buffet there. That was an awesome, awesome spread feast. <laughs> uh, 20, when was that? 20? Uh, in 2014. 2014. Um, yeah, I think, so it was just two years after I started at Stanford. So I, it was, you know, I was, I was surprised that they even knew who I was. So it, it, it was really thrilling to get an international award because I didn't even know people knew me at the time because I, I had only just started my independent research. Um, it, it was a really fun conference. Uh, I remember I flew there with, with an undergraduate student in my group who had just published a paper. So the two of us went to Singapore and the conference was awesome. I, I met some old friends and uh, um, yeah, the food was spectacular, and uh, it, it was very nice to be to be recognized uh, early in my career. I think that awards like that given to to young faculty uh, are really encourage are really encouraging. Professor, uh, there is a common misconception in the community that uh, once you start following a career in science you will always have to be uh, engrossed in your work and uh, there is no time for a personal life. As a prominent scientist, what do you have to say about this matter? Um, I think the people who are engrossed in their work want to be engrossed in their work. They're not, they don't have to be engrossed. I think, I think the people who choose these careers truly enjoy science. And if you, if you really love your work, then uh, thinking about your work is a pleasure. 
Like no one tells me. And I think it's a great life. I mean, this is, I cannot imagine a job where you get more freedom because I get to pick what I work on. I get to pick who I work with. You know, you get to play with all your favorite toys. No one tells you what time to come in, when to leave, what to do. It's you pick your problem, you pick your tools, you pick your collaborators, you pick when you write a paper, when you don't. And uh, it's, it's, it's a wonderful life. You do have to work hard to get there. But once you, once you establish a group, uh, I cannot imagine a better life even for flexibility. And I think, I mean, I, I, I enjoy my work so much that I don't, you know, it's not, no one tells me to work, but there's nothing I would rather do. So as a professor, how do you mentor your students in the context of applying the knowledge gained from the subject matter to conduct the real experiments in the lab? And uh, what sort of an advice would you like to give to the young scientists in order to improve the method of formulating research ideas and designing experiments? Um, so basically I deal with respect to research, I mostly deal with graduate students and postdocs. And um, so I already consider them advanced researchers when they join my group. So I think the whole point of a PhD is to do independent research. So um, in terms of how I help them, I, whenever a student joins my group, I initially pitch a project, but it is a small project and it probably won't work. And it's, it's never meant to be their PhD. It's just an introduction. So they usually start on that project and then they start thinking about what's the next best thing for them to do. Or they'll come to me and say, well, you know, that was a dumb idea, but here's a better one. <laughs> And, um, and that's what I want. I want the students to basically take the lead. And that was my own experience. So none of my advisors ever told me what to do. They just told me, make sure whatever you do is interesting. <laughs> so I, I think uh, as a, in, in your PhD, it's not so much about coursework and applying coursework. It's about, you've already done that. The students that come already have excelled in classes, they've excelled in exams and problem sets. And now there is no clear answer. There's no answer key. So when you do independent research, what you have to learn is to, you know, be comfortable not knowing something and to figure it out by yourself. So uh, I think the main role I play, the one thing that I have that maybe the students don't have is experience in the field. So I can say this project is worth doing this is not worth doing. Even if you did this, no one would care. Uh, the answer is so obvious, why bother do this? So my job is to say, yeah, that is a good, good goal, go for that. But then in terms of the, the finer details, how do we get there? That the, the student takes the lead and that, that's very difficult. So it takes many years. But once you do that, then you, you come out of there with a PhD and you know that you, that PhD belongs to you, not to your advisor. Right? So that's, I very much believe in, in treating students as independent scientists. Why do you think interdisciplinary research is important where scientists from uh, different fields collaborate to find solutions for issues uh, and to bridge the diverse gaps uh, that are there in the uh, fields of science? Um, so I just think that the problems you're tackling are so complex that no one person has the expertise to know every aspect of the problem. So again, if you take perovskite photovoltaics, I'm a synthetic chemist. Uh, I know how to make materials. I know how to study them. I know how to make them reproducibly. I know how to, to describe their structures, their electronic properties, their transport properties of the bare films. Uh, I can then make a film and I can study the properties of the film. But at some point, I have to work with someone who knows the next step in terms of in incorporating it into a device. So then I would collaborate with a device scientist whose expertise is on all the different layers that have to go into this device. 
and optimizing the device, encapsulating the device, measuring uh, the, the performance metrics under, under operational conditions. But then we might run into a problem and there might be, you know, the device efficiency might be low and we don't know why. Then we might have to collaborate with a spectroscopist whose expertise is to study the material, study some characteristic of the material in an operating device uh, using, you know, synchrotron x-rays, for example. So depending on the problem, you, you need so many people with so many different types of expertise that no one person would know all of it. And uh, I think we are in a very collaborative environment where when we, have, when we do these collaborations, I don't simply ship my materials to the device engineer. Uh, my student takes the material that they make to my collaborator's lab. And then my student learns what, about the methods they use. So the students involved see every aspect of this. So the, duo, the students will actually come out of this knowing more than the individual peers because the students work together. And I think it's important to do that because there are often feedback loops. So say the spectroscopy says, oh, I figured out there's this defect that's hurting your device efficiency. Can you get rid of this defect? Then they come back to me and they say, oh, you have this defect in your material. Can you fix it? And I say, yeah, I can. We work on the synthesis and then we start the loop again. So my next question is, uh, in the way of conventional thinking, females rarely choose material science and synthetic chemistry as their core field of research. So were there any challenges you had to face after you entered into this particular field? Yeah, you know, I don't know why there aren't enough, why women don't choose synthesis, synthetic chemistry and materials chemistry. I can't think of any reason why this would be uh, more challenge, this field would be more challenging than any other field. <laughs> so that's, that's a mystery to me as well. If, if you ever figure that out, <laughs> let me know. Uh, in terms of challenges, I mean, every field has challenges. Like when you start as a new faculty member, the biggest challenge you have is to make a name for yourself and make a reputation for yourself. And building a reputation from scratch is very, very important and very difficult because, you know, it's hard to build a good reputation. It's very easy to destroy your reputation. So you have to be very careful of the first papers. You have to give a lot of talks. You have to be known. It takes a lot of work. But that's true in any field. So I'm not sure why there are so few women in materials chemistry. I hope that changes. Uh, the, the halide perovskite field is the most competitive field I have ever encountered. I think every photovoltaic group in the world has a perovskite effort. And um, it's, it's, so when you're in an extremely competitive field, uh, you have to work very hard to make sure that you are known for your contributions to the field. So I have certainly worked very hard to make sure that we get credit for the things that we have done. So I, I give a lot of talks, I travel around the world and uh, I make sure my students get credit for their work and that because there are so many papers every day and it's very hard to keep track of who does what. So there are certainly challenges in a very crowded field. But it's also extremely exciting to be in a crowded field because then things are moving quickly. Other people are making really awesome discoveries as well that you can learn from and the field is moving very rapidly. So it's also a great place to be in. So uh, throughout the many years of your scientific career, I'm sure that you have had many ups and downs. I'm sure it must have been a roller coaster ride. So let's focus on the highs at this moment. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about the moment that you consider to be the proudest moment in your professional career? The proudest moment in my professional career. By professional career, do you mean as a faculty member? As a scientist in general. As a scientist in general. Um, so the, the memory that sticks out the most in terms of the moment when I was most excited about something I had done was when I was a student. 
Um, so I told you about that, that molecule, right? The molecule that was in the bottom of my flask and I poured water and it bubbled, but that was, it, that was cool, but you know, no one's going to use that to generate hydrogen. Uh, so then I was given this task of um, trying to make the reaction electrocatalytic. Uh, but then I struggled for a long time trying to figure out how to make the catalysis, the catalytic cycle go. And uh, I was able to see some catalysis, but it, it was nothing impressive. And then late one night, uh, I was, so I worked mostly at night in, in, the, in my lab uh, as a graduate student, uh, purely by choice. And um, I was reading this electrochemistry book and I started reading about mercury electrodes. And for various reasons, I thought that if I had a mercury electrode, uh, that it, I, I should really check whether my molecule can absorb on a mercury electrode and whether that would help the catalysis. Uh, but we didn't have a mercury electrode. In fact, you know, we, we, we were not an electrochemistry group at all. Um, so I actually just took a beaker, poured some mercury into it, stuck a copper wire in there and made this horrible mercury electrode, <laughs> which looked awful. But I just figured, you know, it's, it's, I just want to see whether this thing works. And then it was past midnight and I was trying to do this catalysis on my mercury electrode and then the whole solution just turned white. And I thought, great, I destroyed my complex, everything decomposed and I'll probably start again tomorrow. Uh, but then I looked more carefully at this beaker and it was full of bubbles. So the reason the solution was white is because this thing was churning out hydrogen. And that was incredibly exciting, except that, you know, there are a hundred things that could have gone wrong. So uh, I refused to get excited. I said that I had to do every possible control. <laughs> so I decided not to go home <laughs> until I had run every possible control. And uh, by the time I went home, like the next day, I realized I had this really awesome catalyst. So it, it was that night is probably what stands out definitely in my graduate career. And uh, because now as a PI, I don't get the discovery aspect, right? Because I'm not in the lab. By the time I hear my students say they have an exciting result, they've already experienced the excitement. And then they tell me about it. But it was when you're a student, you're in there. So I think that is my, my biggest high. That sounds really interesting, Professor. So that was, that was a fun night. Moving on to the last few questions in our discussion. Uh, what is the best piece of advice you have received and how did it impact you and your work? Uh, I have received a lot of good advice. So what's the best piece of advice? How did it impact my work? Um, so, so, you know, with respect to my work, I think uh, one of the most important things we do as a scientist is communicate our work. And uh, like my advisors have often told me that the most important thing you can do is give a good talk. Because you could write the greatest papers that no one will ever read. You can do the coolest research that no one will ever know about. The only time you get to actually stand up and say, this is what I did, this is what I discovered, is when you're giving a talk. So throughout my career, people have emphasized how important it is to give a good talk. So I think the best advice I received about giving a good talk, well, there, there's two pieces of advice that, that I think are, are just up there. One, uh, what I use every time when I give a talk is actually something that my father told me. So my father is a, a professor of uh, Buddhist studies, University of Kalania. And uh, I used to go to his lectures when I was uh, very young. <laughs> and, when I, I, and I didn't really understand the lecture, but you know, there would be this, this room full of people like hanging on every word he said. I was wondering like, why are all these people listening to you? <laughs> And I, this was some time ago, but when I was in school, I asked my father, you know, like, how do you give a good talk? And he said that uh, 
the only way to give a good talk is to forget yourself. So if you're worried about how you look, but if you worry about what you're saying, uh, you cannot give a good talk. And if you worry about what the audience is thinking of you or what the audience is doing or saying or thinking, uh, you cannot give a good talk. So you have to completely lose yourself in the talk. And if you don't do that, then the audience won't also lose themselves in the talk. So that's something I use for every talk I give. I, and then that also means you don't get nervous about the talk. You don't care what anyone thinks. Uh, you're just there to forget yourself and just talk about this thing that you're most excited about. Uh, so that, I think, is the best advice I've received about giving a talk. Um, my graduate advisor also told me that whenever I give a talk, that I should make sure that every single person in the audience uh, leaves that talk thinking that uh, they learned something. So from the beginner to the expert. So in your talks, you have to have a little something for a newcomer. And it can't be at too high a level that that person doesn't get anything out of the talk. But you also have to have something for the expert who says, no, I didn't waste my time. I actually learned something in this talk. So, if you so the focus of a talk really has to be to teach not much, just one or two things to every single person in the audience. So now, uh, so that's the advice I got. And that's what I tell my students that the most important thing they can do in their career is to give a good talk. And then if you give a good talk, then people might actually read your papers. <laughs> That is indeed some insightful advice. Uh, so to add to that, what is the best piece of advice that you could give, especially to uh, young Sri Lankan scientists and to all uh, budding scientists all over the world? Um, I think, you know, science, uh, being a scientist, it's, it's, uh, it's a long-term investment. You know, and I say it's, it's not a sprint, it's a long distance run. So you really have to enjoy the process. I think the people who do well are the people who keep at it and the people who keep at it are the people who genuinely enjoy the work. So I think if you're, if you're too tied to the results, if you're happy only when you get a good result, then your life is full of ups and downs because you're gonna get many more bad results before you get a good result. But if instead you enjoy the process, you enjoy the, you know, whatever it is, synthesis or spectroscopy, but if you enjoy your day-to-day -day work, then your happiness is not tied to the data. It's, you know, you're happy just being a scientist, you enjoy the scientific method. And I think that's what, that's what really defines the people who, 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 who keep at it. And I think it's people who keep at it that succeed. So I would just say, enjoy the process. It's a good life. So with that, we would like to wind up today's interview. Uh, well, Professor, it is really a great honor and a pleasure to talk with you. More profoundly as Sri Lankans, we feel very much privileged in talking to you and gaining the knowledge you shared. So this is a great inspiration for us, and we are sure it might have given some enthusiasm to all those who would like to embark in the field of science. Yes, Kithari. In fact, I learned so much and I'm sure our viewers did too. We are truly grateful to Professor Hema Karunandasan for taking the time and sharing your invaluable ideas, knowledge, and most importantly, your experience with us. Thank you for joining with us, Professor. Have a nice day. And to our viewers, stay tuned for, for more videos just like this. Okay, thanks very much, Kesari and Tanuja. This was, this was wonderful.